Welcome to your brand new TT capsule, or to be more accurate, a simulated version of it, as this is a digital instruction manual designed to assist newly graduated Time Lords to pilot their TT capsules with precision and efficiency, and, seeing as you activated this instruction manual, you must be the new Time Lords assigned to this ship. I'm assuming there are six of you of course, as that is the recommended number of pilots for a TT capsule such as this one, and to attempt to operate the ship without the number of pilots required would just be ridiculous. In any case, allow me to introduce myself. I am the Time Lord known as the Scribe, and I shall be your guide through the endless world of possibilities that is time and space travel. This tutorial will outline the basic functions of a TT capsule, or as I will be referring to it for the rest of this guide, a TARDIS, including the most basic apparatus on the main console, dematerialization and rematerialization procedures, the outer plasmic shell and the chameleon circuit, as well as the various auxiliary rooms. Please bear in mind that these instructions were designed for the latest Type 40 TARDIS that was most infamously stolen by a human named Clara Oswald and her accomplice, a shielder. Please note, this use or theft of any capsule will result in extreme penalties and possible exile. The instructions given may differ between different types and variants. It's also worth noting that this instruction manual is designed for beginners, so some of the more advanced controls, such as the blue stabilizers, helmet regulator, zigzag plotter, randomizer, telepathic circuits, and force fields, will not be covered in depth in this virtual presentation. The default desktop theme is being used for the simulation, so the positions of certain instruments may change depending on your desktop theme and architectural reconfiguration. Now with all that out of the way, we can begin. Part 1. The console. Since we've just visited the scanner, where better to start than the scanner control, which simply activates and deactivates the scanner. Moving along, this array of switches controls power distribution to the various TARDIS subsystems. These levers create a stable gravity field regardless of the exterior gravity field. Next, we have one of my favourite controls, the fast return, which, when pressed, transports the TARDIS to its previous location. For your safety, every TARDIS features a double lock, which, when activated, is nearly impossible to break. To conserve on energy, this lever can adjust the TARDIS lighting, like so. Radiation can be fatal if you're not prepared for it, so this monitor will scan the environment for any radiation before you step outside. In a similar fashion to the radiation monitor, these are the power fluctuation and atmosphere readouts. However, some models may feature a gearometer instead. This handy device can detect any motion coming from outside the ship, which can allow time to prepare for a potential hostile encounter. At the beginning of this simulation, you saw the TARDIS doors open. Well, this switch controls that, as with a simple flick, the doors will shut once again. A common misconception among less advanced species is that the time rotor is actually the time column in the centre of the console, when in fact the time rotor is used to regulate vortex travel. As alluded to earlier, the time column is not the time rotor, and is instead used to reflect the flight status of the ship, as when not in flight the time column will remain static, like so, and when it is in flight, the time column will oscillate up and down. Two. Dematerialization and rematerialization procedures. Before we take a look at the dematerialization lever, we're going to take a brief look at the TARDIS flight process. The dematerialization process can be broken down into four main sections. One, programming of the navigational instruments. This involves programming in your current and desired spatial coordinates relative to Gallifrey's Eye of Harmony at the center of Mutter's Stellian Spiral, and your current and desired temporal location or time period relative to Gallifrey's present. Two, computer acceptance. Assuming you've entered those details correctly, the TARDIS will calculate the epsilon coordinates, which serve as a path or roadmap through the space-time vortex. Three, power buildup to required levels. Once all of these steps have been completed, the TARDIS will build up power to prepare for the upcoming dematerialization. Do keep in mind that it takes 12 minutes to build up enough power in the Time Rotor's energy storage unit to dematerialize after materializing, so it may be worth programming in your next destination in advance. The Master Dematerialization Lever, or as it's sometimes referred to, Switch, that we mentioned earlier, can now be activated. This will engage the laser trigger of the dematerialization circuit and dematerialize the TARDIS. Something else worth mentioning is vortex travel itself, which, while we won't be covering in depth, there are a few things worth mentioning. While within the vortex, the TARDIS operates in walrus mode. The spatial drive will activate automatically when a TARDIS has entered the space-time vortex. It is impossible to alter coordinates once the ship has activated the spatial drive, although the brake can be used to temporarily deviate to another time zone. 
but the original course will have to be completed eventually. Once in the vortex, a TARDIS requires a minimum of one quarter of full power, 1000 omegas, to travel. And finally, travel through a vortex wormhole can be displayed on the scanner. In some instances, the time vortex has been known to display a different colour depending on what temporal location you choose, with a red tinted tunnel being displayed for travel forwards in time, and a blue tin indicates travel to the relative past. Now that we've taken a look at dematerialization or takeoff, let's take a look at rematerialization or landing, which can also be broken down into four main sections. 1. Synchronic feedback unit activation. The main materialization indicator begins to flash brighter and brighter one minute before rematerialization. It will continue flashing until the materialization is complete. At this point, the synchronic feedback checking unit should be activated. 2. Multi-loop stabilizer activation. To prevent materialization a few inches above the intended coordinates, the multi-loop stabilizer must be activated prior to landing. The multi-loop stabilizer adjusts a TARDIS to land on a surface. 3. Release the brakes. Before rematerialization, the brake, aka pause control, should be released. This prevents the sound of the dimensional stabilizers from being heard. However, myself and many other terminals like the sound of the dimensional stabilizers, so you can skip this step if you would prefer. 4. Rematerialization. Rematerialization is the most dangerous part of TARDIS flight. A TARDIS has an automatic landing procedure for rematerialization, but it's advisable for the operator to use manual materialization, since even minor malfunctions in the automatic procedure could destroy the TARDIS by sending it outside the time spiral. Three, the outer plasmic shell. The default exterior setting for the Type 40 TARDIS is a cylindrical structure with a sliding door that is tall enough and wide enough to permit the ingress and egress of High Council officials in the ceremonial robes. 4. The Chameleon Circuit When the TARDIS rematerializes in a new location, within the first nanosecond of landing, it analyzes its surroundings, calculates a 12-dimensional data map of everything within a thousand mile radius, and determines which outer shell would blend in best with the environment. An example of this would be when the rebel Time Lord known as the Doctor stole a faulty TARDIS and took it to Earth in 1963, where the comedian circuit transformed the outer shell into a police telephone box. 5. Auxiliary Rooms Finally, let's talk about where you're going to be spending most of your time, the auxiliary rooms. These rooms could be altered at will using the architectural configuration systems. If additional power is needed, these rooms could be deleted to generate energy. These rooms could be divided into three categories, working areas, these include the Eye of Harmony, the source of the ship's power not to be confused with the Eye of Harmony on Gallifrey, the architectural reconfiguration chamber, the cloisters, the engine room, the power room, ancillary power room, tool room, laboratory, workshops and storeroom, and the garage. Rest and recreation, these include bedrooms, bathroom facilities, wardrobe, kitchen, library, swimming pool, art gallery, and karaoke bar, among others. And finally, body and soul. Things like the sick bay, zero room, and even the primary user's tomb, which is what the control room is converted into at the end of its operational lifespan. On that rather morbid note, we've reached the end of the simulation. I hope you found these instructions helpful, as it can sometimes be a little bit overwhelming going from textbooks to an actual TARDIS. So much so that even experienced Time Lords often make mistakes when piloting their TARDIS. But the most important thing you can do is swear never to interfere with the affairs of other peoples or planets. Only observe. For Gallifrey, for the Time Lords, for the President. Mm -hmm.